Good evening, everyone. My name is Carver. I am a clinical application specialist here at Oculus. Welcome to tonight's clinical webcast, Decoding Keratoconus and Progression Inside the Matrix. You have a text box on your GoToWebinar screen where you can enter in questions. Feel free to enter your questions at any time, and we will address them at the end of tonight's webcast. Our speakers tonight are Dr. Biran McPara and Dr. Clark Chang. They're both uh, have a ton of experience with keratoconus, and I'm so excited to hear them talk tonight. Dr. Biran, uh, Biran McPara, MD, is the co-director of refractive surgery and a member of the cornea service at Wills Eye Hospital in Philadelphia. His surgical interests include layer-specific corneal transplantation, refractive cataract surgery, and complex anterior segment repair. He is a team ophthalmologist for the Philadelphia Phillies baseball team and was selected by his peers as both Philadelphia Magazine Top Doctor and Castle Colony Top Doctor. He is actively involved in resident education at Wills Eye Hospital and was awarded the prestigious Golden Apple Resident Training Teaching Award. Clark Chang OD is a director of specialty lenses and cornea department at Wills Eye Hospital and also, you know, same hospital, Philadelphia. He is the host of the popular podcast, Chang Reaction. He has over a decade of research experience in corneal cross-linking and other advanced corneal treatments. And in recent years, he's been honored with Top Doctor of 2020 by the National Keratoconus Foundation, the 2021 Luminary Award for Distinguished Practice by the American Optometric Association, and the Tommy Pham GPLI Keratoconus Practitioner of the Year Award in 2023. I'm so excited for this presentation and I always learn so much. So Dr. McPara, Dr. Clark Chang, take it away. Thank you, Carver. And I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight uh, to pay tribute to uh, World Keratoconus Day. And obviously, hopefully, we can come together and elevate our keratoconus patient care together. Um, so let me get into this is, uh, I, you know, uh, it's not a CME or CE, but this is our disclosures. This is for um, Dr. Mepara. This is for myself. Full disclosure, I'm also the, uh, medical, uh, the director of medical affairs in Glaucos. So to kick us off, you hopefully don't find this corny, but we're a fan, at least I'm a huge fan of the movie Matrix. So we pulled out different quotes throughout tonight to share with you in hope to kind of highlight some of our principle of um, management uh, in terms of our keratoconus patient care in our cornea service at Will's Eye. So enter at your own risk. And uh, so, you know, what what is new or what is something that we wish we at least I myself would have done differently uh, at the beginning of my career to now in how I interact or take care of my keratoconus patients. I think that the, you know, we've always had this sense that potentially our keratoconus patients, um, not potentially, that they are complaining more than we think they should. And so is there, where's the disconnect, right? Is it in their personality, which have been the proposed mechanism for a while, or is it just that we are underestimating the impact of the disease and the urgency to, after you deliver a diagnosis, to manage and intervene? So I think if you look, if we look at some of the epidemiology study, and we had some of these data, you know, ready in the CLEX time in the late 1990s and 2000, we knew that there's a very disproportional impact of the keratoconus disease compared to something else that uh, like macular degeneration that we tend to you know intervene at an earlier stage or at least our desire to intervene is greater um so we knew that again there's some sort of disconnect so you know if you then kind of survey some of the more recent literature you could see that um in, that the you know the, there's a proponent of hey the quality uh, the reduction of the quality of life or quality of vision in keratoconus patients potentially are not directly correlated to any clinical measures such as visual acuity. So I think that tells us that we should really try to move away from thinking that keratoconus is solely a disease of reduced visual acuity, right? Because that then affects our subsequent management. Um, and we have proven the pudding, again, CLEC study has shown us that despite the fact that majority of the patients wears 
um, contact lenses at, uh, at the mo at when they're enrolled and it's an observational study so no other you know surgical treatments were given um, despite having worn corneal GPs because majority of the patients in that study were corneal GP a majority of the contact lens wearing uh, subjects and you could see that their uh, vision related quality of life continues to decline over the seven to eight years uh, period of time that these patients were observed and I think, I, and if you haven't read the, um, the more recent article from um, Emily Durokovich uh, at all, um, it was, I think, May of this year. And it actually looked at, um, it reviewed the mental health impact uh, data in the literature um, that gives us correlations to mental health impact of keratoconus. It's a very worthy read. And it po also pointed out similarly that um, they're finding the same thing where even compared to patients with glaucoma. Again, something we actively screen for and actively want to treat. Sometimes before even signs and symptoms occurred or are noticed by the patients when they have glaucoma or when we suspect glaucoma. And so you can see even with the possibly better visual acuity in keratoconus patients because of how good we are at contact lens fitting uh, or the advancement of contact lens management and also the ability to stabilize their cornea. Um, you know, the again, good, good visual acuity potential in keratoconus patients still um, is not coming through or reflected in their self-assessment of their mental well-being and mental health. Um, and that's the same when you compare keratoconus patients to macular degeneration, as I had mentioned before, or diabetic retinopathy or vein occlusion. Um, so I've listed the, um, the literature there for you to uh, read at your own leisure. So then what do we do? What should we be doing differently? I think we need to enhance I think we've always done this, but we need to be even more on, you know, vigil. We need to be more vigilant in listening to patients, um, reading patients' history, their reported symptoms, and, and how we could correlate them in finding clues about whether or not uh, we can catch them prior to um, noticeable visual reduction, right? So with something like family history, something like uh, eye rubbing or a topic associated with the topic diseases, um, the more checklists you have on the risk factor or associations, then the more that you should start thinking, should I actively be screening the patient? Um, another way would be actively screen everybody coming into your clinic for regular eye exams, but you know, obviously there are challenges there to do that. Um, so I think we need to listen them more um, vigilantly uh, in terms of it, do they have, not so much that they have reduced vision, because I'm hoping that after tonight we'll put that clue, loss of vision, um, as the very last line um, that you know, that led, leads to us to uh, think about detecting keratoconus. Potentially, we could find them earlier, whether it's because they are reporting symptoms dis disproportional to their patient profile, meaning if they're complaining about halo glare, that sounds like cataract-like symptom, but they are in their 20s. So you know that statistically speaking, chances of them having cataract is very low. Um, so potentially think corneal origins and uh, irregular cornea. Do they have frequent, uh, frequent changes in their manifest refraction, such as uh, criteria used in phase three study that led to cross-linking approval uh, by FDA in US, um, such as myopia shift or spherical equivalents of greater than half a diopter, my, uh, my you know, shift of um, uh, refra uh, of uh, refraction or yeah, increasing cylinder one diopter of change within meaning could be less than a year right so we don't have to wait for a year to compare but anytime within that period of time um, and then in your if you are seeing some of these clues or do you have other instruments even if you don't have a, even if you're not actively screening patients, whether it's because we all have multiple clinical locations, maybe you're at a location that does not have a topographer or tomographer, um, potentially look at the uh, Placido Meyer uh, distortions, whether it's on your auto refractor or manual keratometry, um, things like that. And again, hopefully, you know, loss of vision um, is the very last clue that we use in terms of thinking whether or not a patient could potentially um, have keratoconus. 
Um, and uh, because, you know, in line with what AAO's preferred practice pattern, American Academy of Ophthalmology, the reason we want to try to detect patients earlier is because we can combine treatments, right? We could try to stabilize patient uh, against further progression, therefore to preserve good visual quality with glasses and contact lenses. And I think that's our ultimate goal in preserving patients' visual acuity so that uh, they can uh, maintain high quality of uh, life and high quality of vision. So you may think, hey, how is it possible that these you could have patients who have manifestation of keratoconus um, and yet they don't notice it? Um, obviously, it is possible that we know that keratoconus is highly asymmetric. Uh, asymmetrical. So if they're, you know, bin binocularly never block one eye, it is possible they don't notice that. But more than that, if you look at these topography or actual patient cases, you could, you would likely not think that this patient is 2020. However, prefers to wear a uh, contact lens. And you may simply think, is that just regular astigmatism, right? That's a possibility. But if you don't really you don't really know early asymmetry unless you do a screening. And if, you're, if we're only purely going by 2020, we're not gonna catch these patients early enough. And if we look at the case on the left hand, on the, um, on my, on the right hand side to your screen, you'll think, just looking at that Excel map, I don't even need to look at elevation and, and maps and or, or thickness distribution, that there's just no way that this patient it would not notice any type of vision changes. And I will tell you that this patient has plano over refraction. Now, it could be that the just noticeable um, differences in your peropter being we're only showing patient quarter units apart, that they're not able to tell the difference. That, that certainly could be true. Could also just be the visual, we don't know the location of the visual axis. Could be the patient has really small pupil. There are many other reasons. And if we're not, you know, carefully documenting those patient characteristics, we may not understand why this patient has no, uh, has very low refractive error, is seeing 2020, and however still complains about visual quality issues like glare and halo or monocular diplopia. And here's another case just to kind of drive that point home that we should not really only be uh, relying on patient subjective feedback about their vision or relying solely on vision in stimulating our suspicion for keratoconus. So here's a case of, by um, Dr. Uh, William Trattler and Dr. Elise Kramer um, from Florida. So they had, so there's an 18 year old patient, um, low myo presented. The sole reason this patient was referred into Dr. Trattler's clinic was because of red eye. Uh, and it turned out that this um, patient had uh, SEIs and um, a viral etiology, so they di was diagnosed with viral conjunctivitis, never had any issue with this patient's vision. And in fact, very recently within the last year, had a regular eye exam with um, 2020, 2020 plus, and was given updated glasses prescription, and that was it. Um, however, after the viral conjunctivitis, resolve, patient kept saying that something is different uh, with the patient's vision and ultimately led to a topography screening, actually tomography with Pentacam, as you can see the images, and it revealed that this patient has keratoconus despite never had documented visual reduction and had a very recent eye exam with purely a glasses prescription change not even in contact lenses, right? So again, we should not only be relying on vision to diagnose our patient. So you may say, well, you know, I, is there anything else I can do? Maybe you're in a clinic, like we have multiple clinic locations, but I can refer all patients and I suspect of having corneal etiologies such as keratoconus to this one central location, but I only have a topographer. Um, we're not saying that you need, you can only rely on events, corneal imaging, like a uh, shine fluke based, um, you know, tomographer such as Pentacam, you could still get very good readings, I think. Um, although probably not, you know, early emerging keratoconus, but you'll likely catch patients who are moderate, uh, hopefully not severe, uh, keratoconus. So such as if we try to, my recommendation would be lower our threshold of what we used to rely on, 
in terms of um, the cutoff between normal and abnormal. So we used to think maybe 48, 49 diopter in this uh, Stevens K, uh, say in the sim K or central K. So I would say go down to 47 if we're goal is to for early detection of keratoconus, right? So look for the inferior um, superior uh, ratio or IS value at the six millimeter uh, area and compare to see if there's extreme um, or even moderate amount of asymmetry such as uh, IS value being greater than 1.4 um, and uh, look for a non-orthogonal um, asymmetrical or irregular astigmatism, look for radius skew, um, I think even more importantly, look for small amount of consistent increases in their prescription or keratometry values because at some point they should patients should not be increasing very frequently with their refractive attribute or keratometric attributes, right? And you may say, well, what, what is, you made a comment about not catching early keratoconus with a placebo-based topography, why is that? Because we're not, just like a lot of, um, some of the uh, grading schemes of keratoconus severity that we rely on in the past, it doesn't, pro, you know, placido topography also similarly does not give you information on the posterior corneal surface. So it only gives you a diagnosis or raise a red flag when the anterior contour has been affected. And we know that many of keratoconus patients um, they, the uh, origin of the disease, um, or at least the, the beginning of the manifestation is detected earlier in the posterior layer of the stroma. Um, and therefore you're not getting, you're not accounting for posterior surface. You're also not getting corneal thickness distribution, right? Um, and one reason that's important is because meaning not accounting for posterior surface. Why is it important to account for posterior surface? Because your epithelium can remodel and mask mild amount of irregularity as you can see here in the images. And so you, in your first two um, graph, you could see that the contours or the asphericity of the cornea is being maintained very similarly, but the thickness of the, um, the corneal thickness is changing. Right, so early keratoconus is going to be difficult. Um, the and it's going to be difficult to be detected by topography that looks only at anterior surface when shifting corneal epithelial thickness can mask some amount of that um, a that uh, irregularity only until when it becomes moderate or maybe potentially severe when the remodeling of the epithelium is no longer holding that uniformity of the anterior surface, would you then start seeing vision being affected or picking clues up on topography? So that's one reason why we really can, you know, um, and again, we're pulling quotes from uh, from the movie to highlight our principles, so hopefully you don't find this corny, but you know, we're obviously not going to uh, look past the choices that we don't understand. Neither does our patients. So we need to anatomically look past that epithelium. And so if you only rely on anterior um, topography metrics, you're not going to catch those patients. So Dr. McPara, how do we look past the influence of, uh, say, something like epithelium? How do we diagnose these patients at an earlier time point? Right. Clark, I agree with everything that you said. The goal here is to diagnose as early as possible um, because we now have an effective treatment for this that we'll talk about. Um, later on to stabilize the disease. You know, that just not to digress, but what you said about mental health in these patients is is a very important thing. And, and one of the things that is is kind of underrated or not always at the top of our minds is these are, for the most part, young individuals um, kind of in a very productive part of their life or even before they've even reached that productive part of their life. You know, they're in their teens or early 20s. And, and you give them this diagnosis and, and basically tether them to a scleral contact lens, and they see really well with that, but they are forced to use that for the remainder of their lives. Um, that, that can be tough. So the earlier we can diagnose them, um, maintaining as much vision as we can, and, and you know, best case scenario, maybe even spectacle corrected vision, um, or the potential to see yeah. in spectacles at least and not be fully dependent, it really right. does require early diagnosis and stabilization. And the gold standard to making that early diagnosis is, is not waiting for a change in vision, um, yeah. 
placebo-based photographers are great, but but not waiting for changes in that, but instead looking at the posterior cornea and looking at posterior elevation. Um, so the back side of the cornea starts to become elevated. And also looking at abnormal corneal thickness distribution, not necessarily focal areas of corneal thinning, which is important, but if you're just using a handheld ultrasound pachymeter, um, you're missing a lot of data. So a device like the Pentacam, for example, takes what's called a pachymetry map. And we get this pachymetric distribution over the entire surface of the cornea um, that is very helpful. And I mean, it's not just me saying this, it's not just my opinion. You know, the global Delphi panel of, of keratoconus and ectatic diseases um, also agrees with this. And, and, you know, the key to diagnosing mild or subclinical keratoconus is looking for that posterior elevation. And the best way to do that, the best way to diagnose early keratoconus is tomography, either shine fluke based like the Pentacam um, or, or OCT based technology. Uh, so the key is look at the back of the cornea and look at um, corneal thickness. Now, when you have a tomographer, so this is uh, an image taken from the Pentacam, you know, there's two things that you can get from this. You know, when I look at these images, I look at um, kind of qualitative images. You know, I look for patterns, I look for distribution, um, I look for change over time, but you can also look for numbers. So there are certain cutoffs um, where we do start to suspect keratoconus. So in a myopic individual, if you have um, greater than 18 microns of elevation um, or, or 28 microns in a hyperopic patient, that is, is concerning for the beginnings of keratoconus. Anteriorly, that change is, is about eight microns. Now, this is all relative to what's called a best fit sphere, and I'll talk about that um, on the next slide a little bit. But if you're looking for numbers, those are some potential numbers. Um, where I think numbers are probably more relevant that I look at them more is on the pachymetry map, right? So a few things that we look at is asymmetry between the two eyes. So typically, you know, the, the thinnest location on the cornea um, is pretty similar between the two eyes. And if you have um, a variation of greater than 20, uh, 25 microns, that um, occurs in less than 1% of the population. Um, so that that is a very um, useful number to look for, a greater than 25 micron difference between the two eyes. The other thing is, where is that apex? So typically the thinning of the cornea, the thinnest point in the cornea is located fairly close to the apex. If that apical, uh, if that point of thinning is decentered from the apex by greater than 0.8 millimeters, that's also a risk factor for keratoconus. And then looking at the superior and the inferior corneal thickness and comparing that within the same eye. Um, and a pachymetry map is very useful for that. And if you see a difference between 50 microns between the superior and inferior cornea, that is worrisome for keratoconus. So numbers wise, I do find these pachymetry measurements to be a little bit more helpful, at least in my practice. Now we talked about elevation and we talked about best fit sphere. So it does help to, to give a little bit of background of how do we get these elevation maps? Elevation can be drawn out or, or depicted on these devices as a reference to something. So something is elevated compared to what, right? Or something is depressed or, or below what? And, and that what is a best fit sphere. So what a best fit sphere is, is it's generated by the device um, and it's basically a, a, a mean or, or, or kind of in between sphere and, and half of the cornea is above it and half of the cornea is below it. And then you can graphically depict what is elevated and what is depressed. And it's a good way to, to map out a cornea. And there is versatility in using this um, and in using tomography. And the key, like we were talking about, is try to detect subtle changes as early as possible, right? So what can we do to make our elevation maps more sensitive? Well, we can kind of enhance this. And on the Pentacam, we have something called the Bell and Ambrosio Enhanced Ectasia, Ectasia Display, where when calculating the best fit sphere, the software will exclude um, a three to four millimeter zone of the thinnest cornea, okay? And by doing that, what we're doing is we're basically lowering that best fit sphere, accentuating any areas of elevation. So anything that may be slightly elevated, it becomes more easy to see on these maps. It lights up, it, it lights up red because red gets our attention um, and it helps pick up these earlier cases of posterior elevation. 
So here's an example of that. Okay, so this is the uh, Pentacam uh, BAD or Bell and Ambrosio um, enhanced, enhanced Ectasia display. And I'm just going to walk you through this printout. This is a readout that I look at multiple times a day in my office. Um, this is the left eye. On the left side of the screen, that column, that's the front of the cornea. On the right side, that's the back of the cornea. Now on the top, the top row, that's your standard elevation map. That's your standard best fit sphere. The second row, the row below it, is your enhanced best fit sphere. So again, there we've excluded the three to four millimeter zone of thinness cornea. And as a result, we've lowered that best fit sphere and anything above that is now more accentuated. So you can see it's the same data that we're using, but it's just interpreted differently. So that area of subtle posterior elevation on the top row um, is now more easily visible as a much larger red spot in that second row. And then the bottom, um, that's not a map of the cornea, that's just a difference between the normal and the enhanced best fit sphere. So again, if it lights up red, we like the easy button, right? We like to be able to look at a sheet in our busy clinic and look and see, you know, is this abnormal normal? that red will indicate that that is um, a significant difference between kind of the normal best fit sphere and the enhanced best fit sphere. And that's a warning sign for keratoconus. Um, so that, that was the left side of the display. So what about the right side of the display? Um, I also look, like to look at this. I like to look at the graphs and the maps and the colors, but I also like to look at the numbers. And we do have um, what's indicated there, the distance in vector notation. That is um, something I do like to look at. And it's the displacement of the thin spot from the apex. Um, so that is a number I do like, do like to look at. And then some of us also like to look at the progression index. Um, but again, it's, it's graphically um, notated um, kind of in a way we can quickly look and understand it. So if it's green, for example, that means it's okay. If it's yellow, the statistical significance is suspicious. And if it's red, we would consider that abnormal. And then at the bottom of the screen, um, that, that's kind of a summary of everything. And, and you have what are known as D scores and you have this global D score. That is the bottom right box all the way in the corner. Um, and, and again, that'll take a lot of information and without getting too deep into the nitty gritty of what each of these numbers mean, again, if we just follow that color scheme, so um, in this situation, white would be okay, yellow would be suspicious, and red would be abnormal. As this number increases, the suspicion for keratoconus goes higher and higher. And we'll have you go to the next slide, slide card. Um, if we have um, a final D, um, that comes back as red, it, the sensitivity is, is 0 0.41 and the specificity is 0 .9, uh, 0.944. Um, so high specificity, high sensitivity in the detection of, of early keratoconus. So um, it's the power of the algorithm, it's the power of taking a lot of data and being able to interpret it um, in a multitude of ways and being able to, to look at that as a, as a eye physician and, and look at that quickly and, and make your decision and, and kind of move on with your day. And I also wanted to point out one more thing before we leave this uh, display, because I find it to be very useful in our practice here and in, um, you know, managing, in, whether it's uh, diagnosing our patient or continuing to manage our patients after the first diagnosis, is we talked about, you had mentioned the thickness distribution is very important. And uh, as well as that was uh, rec that was the recommendation from the Global Delphi Panel uh, of Keratoconus and Ectasia Disease publication. So you could we could definitely those of you who may not have seen these uh, thickness distribution map, uh, you could see them like on the first four tiles where um, Abir kind of went through the point by point chemistry distribution. But here you could also see different slices of how. Uh, going from the thinnest point set as zero um, and uh, then going outwards uh, from that in terms of how the rate of distribution changes. This gives, I, in my mind, a very sensitive measure of um, 
you know, just looking at the red line, invisibly very easy to understand. Um, the, the dotted lines are your two standard deviation uh, plus minus, and the red line is your patient going from the thinnest area outwards. And if the red line at any point in time dips below, um, then it tells you that the, the thickness distribution is too aggressive uh, or the rate of thickening is too aggressive going towards the periphery, which tells you that somewhere more central to that zone, you probably have some amount of thinning that's more than the two standard deviation of your norm, uh, of your patient population mean. Um, so to me, that's actually pretty, that that's very visible and how I like to use the, um, the these two CTSP and PTI graphs. I agree. Um, so, you know, here's a case. Um, we've got two patients. Um, both have um, if you look at, you know, these are axial maps, both have some inferior thinning or inferior steepening, sorry. Uh, so the question is, you know, which of these patients has keratoconus? Both of them, neither of them. And what we can uh, do is then, you know, not only are we looking at, you know, topographical changes, but we'll look at pachymetric changes and elevation changes. And, and maybe the one on, on my right side of the screen has some thinning and maybe some elevation, but the one on the left kind of has some elevation too on the back of the cornea. Um, so it would be helpful, right, to have um, an enhanced ectasia display to perhaps help guide us through this. So now, you know, the, the, the scan on the left looks normal, right? So even, you know, there's a question, is there some posterior elevation there? But, you know, we'll uh, kind of change that best fit sphere and not a whole lot. And that corneal um, pachymetric progression look, looks very normal here. But on the right side, you know, there was some suspicious area in the back of the cornea of elevation on the enhanced ectasia display. That area is more accentuated. And then as Clark was mentioning on the graph on the right side, that um, pachymetric uh, progression kind of drops off um, that chart below several standard deviations. And then kind of to sum it up, just to kind of confirm everything that you're seeing on the graphs, if you look at the bottom, if you look at all the D scores, not even looking at the numbers, but they've all they all light up red, right? So this this is a big warning sign for for this being keratoconus. Right, and I have to tell you my favorite character from the movie, at least the first Matrix, is Agent Smith. Um, so you know, the never because I think he has all the cool quotes of uh, one of such is uh, one of my favorite quotes is uh, never send a human to do a machine shot. But you know, again, going back to some of the epidemiology data that I was talking about at the outset. Uh, we also know that keratoconus patients, regardless of how many instruments and how many algorithms that we have, point, you know, case in point, if you look at this uh, uh, article from um, Krebs et al. from Belgium, and uh, they also, they have a national health that is, that is very easy to refer patients for secondary and tertiary care. And so patients are, to, you would think that, and also having access to events instruments, they have, um, they have Pentacam, they also have topographer um, pulling from you know, patients from different clinical sites. And they still find that going retrospectively, going through their charts, that majority of the patients um, are diagnosed after age 18, and only a small percentage of patients are diagnosed before age 18. And by the time they're diagnosed, majority of them already have uh, a stage two out of four. And so in no way is that emerging early keratoconus. And it's not from lack of access to technology. Um, it's depending on, you know, so it reminds me that we still need to pull the trigger in terms of knowing when to detect those clues and be able to then, you know, refer patient for more advanced imaging or order uh, more advanced imaging if you have access to that in your clinic. And so once that you diagnose the patients then, um, the, obviously the most important thing is to decide if they, very similar to glaucoma care, right? If you have a patient that you suspect of glaucoma for, from your exam findings, you're the, and traditionally you at least wanna monitor their visual field and see if there's any change in that or, or in their structure such as my OCT. So same thing, we need to know whether or not patient is progressing, but hopefully, not let them continue to progress in large intervals. Um, so again, trying to detect progression at the earliest time point is very important. How do we do that? And going back to that uh, global uh, Delphi panel um, expert recommendation is to at least look for changes in 
uh, two of the three parameters that they recommended, which is progressive steepening of anterior corneal surface. We can do that with topography. Progressive steepening of posterior corneal surface. We know that we have to rely on more advanced instrument like a tomography, as well as looking for the change in the rate of corneal thickness distribution. Those curves that we told you about in the uh, BAD display, changes in the rate of that uh, is what we're looking for. Again, you require more advanced algorithms such as tomography. Uh, like a pendicam. And we also need to get in one of their recommendations, which is a point that really resonated with me, which is that although you progression can be accompanied with vision changes, it is not required. So we need to get out the, of the mindset that we place ourselves in, as well as our patient in, which is they need to you know, they don't need to demonstrate loss of vision for you to think that they have they have keratoconus or for you to think that their keratoconus is progressing. So we need to, vision is a great cue, but not the only cue. So, um, Viren, how will we then monitor, how can we utilize the more advanced algorithm that we have to monitor for progression? Right, so we talked about how to make the early diagnosis, right? And that's using the, Bell and Ambrosio enhanced ectasia display by excluding right the thinnest point and then accentuating any areas of uh, elevation. When we want to monitor for progression, we actually focus on that point. So we're we're focusing on the area that is steepest, that is thinnest, and we're looking for changes in that area. And that is the the Bell and ABCD display. Okay, and what this does is it looks at four different things. Okay, it looks at the radius of curvature, which is the A score of the anterior cornea, the radius of curvature of the posterior cornea, which is the B score, corneal thickness, so at, at the thinnest point, which is the C score, and then D is visual acuity, which is something the Pentacam doesn't measure. You have to input that in yourself. Um, so the nice thing about this is we're looking at the steepest or the most diseased part of the cornea and looking for changes over time. And when patients come in, each subsequent visit will get depicted graphically on this screen. And then we look for progression. So as that bar graph extends further to the right, that is a sign of progression. And we have those gates that are located there. So we have green gates and we have red gates. And what those are are confidence intervals. Um, so we have an 80% confidence interval and a 95% confidence interval. Um, so the green gates are confidence intervals in a normal cornea and the red gates are confidence intervals in an abnormal or a keratoconic cornea. And the reason that's important is if you scan a patient 10 times in a row, you're going to get a little bit different scan. So um, it, it, it basically helps eliminate some of the noise. But a normal cornea is still going to be more uniform than an abnormal cornea. So if you scan a keratoconus 10 times in a row, that variability is going to be even more. So that threshold to consider it progression is further out to the right than you would have in a normal cornea. So for me, when I look at this, if I see two scores that cross the 80% confidence interval, that to me is progression. Or if I have one score that crosses the 95% interval, that to me is considered progression. Now there's different ways to align this. Uh, you can align it um, with with um, align it based on the baseline, so basically where the scale is, and this accentuates more subtle differences, or you can align everything at zero um, and use the full scale, which kind of gives you kind of an easier way to compare between the different parameters, but it can make it a little bit more uh, difficult to pick up subtle changes. I do it the first way. In my practice, we, we rarely change it. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of different ways to de detect progression. Clark talked about some of them. You know, we talked about this ABC display. What I used to do before using this piece of um, software is just looking at KMAX, and that's a very popular way to look for progression. And typically, if you have a KMAX that's increased by greater than one diopter, that's considered progression. So I have a patient here, and if you look at the KMAX on the bottom where you have that oval, um, it really hasn't changed, okay? Um, and the issue with K-max, it's a taking a measurement at just one point of the cornea, right? Versus the A score or the B score, that's taking a measurement over, um, you know, a three to four millimeter area of the cornea. So if you look at the A score, 
that has progressed beyond the 95% interval. The B score has gone past the 80% approaching the 95% interval, and the C score has passed the 80% interval. So despite having no significant change in the K-max, I diagnosed this patient with progressive keratoconus, and this patient went on to be cross-linked. And then here's an example, and, and we talked about this earlier, is you know you don't wanna wait until you lose vision. So here is a patient where I actually inputted a D-score, so the vision, and if you look, that's the, that's the circle in, under the, the heading D-score. This patient sees 20-20, right? So this patient sees 20-20, um, the K-max really hasn't changed, that's the oval at the bottom of the screen, but we have a progression in the A-score, we have a progression in the B-score, um, so despite seeing 2020, I went ahead and cross-linked this patient um, to, to preserve the vision that they have um, before you know, they become fully dependent on a contact lens, for example. And sometimes, I love your explanations, Bjorn, and I feel like sometimes we feel like, well, you know, how accurate, you talked about variability uh, between exams, and, and sometimes there's a little bit of you know, misunderstanding of how accurate can some of these events instruments be. For example, you may think that the, here we have a patient uh, from our service um, who's, you know, 39 years old and uh, has not been cross-linked and we're wondering, you know, is this patient getting to be more stable uh, with time? That, not to say that patients don't progress after age of 40 or 50s. We certainly have those patients as well. Um, but here you see that there's a you know, over many different visits over from 2019 to 2023, uh, we're, you know, seeing variability in A, but we're consistently seeing change in B over 95%. So the question is, should we be cross-linking this patient? Um, and that's where sometimes it, it, there's a little bit of uh, misunderstanding in that, uh, you know, I don't, this patient's contact lens fitting hasn't changed, this patient's vision hasn't changed, but again, we talked about those being less sensitive measures. Regardless, when we reset the, and the K-max did not change again, so if you are only following with keratometry or topography, you are also not be picking up these posterior changes that we're seeing here in the B-score. But regardless, we notice that the first quality, um, data quality is not very strong. So when we reset the baseline to the second um, visit, actually that changed the whole thing. It uh, did not then did not show any type of progression. So either patient progressed between 2019 and 2020 have, and have subsequently stabilized, or that the first one was just an outlier and wasn't the most accurate one to use as a baseline. So sometimes we think we're not getting the, the, you know, the computer's getting it wrong. It could just be that there are human errors or operator errors that we haven't fixed. That's and, a great point. Yeah, and then there may be other things that I know we, a lot of us uh, have OCT in our practice. And, you know, the, the question that I, I know Bjorn and I always get is, well, what do you do with OCT? Is there any supplementary value to having an OCT, and I think they're getting better. And um, but if you look at literature, by for example, this article from Hashemi, it gives you the, it shows you some of the more useful uh, epithelial thickness measures uh, or pachymetry measures from OCT. But you can see the specificity and the sensitivity is still lower than what we showed you. Actually, a lot lower uh, than what we showed you for the from the BAD map using the D scores. So. I think it's getting there. Uh, we certainly think that if you, for example, can be useful to kind of break the ties if everything is very subtle. So for example, here's a patient of, of Biren's, uh, Biren's patient where you could see if we overlay the uh, OCT map, you could see that donut pattern of epithelial hypertrophy at the base of the cone and thinning because of that epithelial remodeling that we talked about and thinning over the apex, which aligns with the steepest portion of the axial map really well. So if we were really questioning, obviously this is undeniable if you look at the elevation map and thickness distribution, but you could see that if we use an extreme example to show you that there's some utility to OCT here that we could use. Um, and as something that I think maybe in the future could be very interesting, I just recently, uh, Beer and I just got back from a meeting and I met up with uh, uh, this researcher, uh, Dr. Cynthia Roberts from OSU and they, uh, Ohio State University, they were actually there, they just published their work on looking at the stress value 
that is exerted on the cornea and how that changes from normal cornea to keratoconus cornea and claiming that the, the point of low stress and high tr stress on the cornea, the more asymmetrical that is, the more likely that that cornea, regardless of topography presentation, the more likely that cornea is keratoconic. And they actually also have uh, worked on longitudinal uh, five-year data where they think they could actually retroactively go back and be able to predict the risk of progression at baseline just using this uh, stress distribution on the cornea and predict kind of the five-year risk factor of developing progression. So that may be something that we could utilize just kind of looking forward into the future. But again, let's come back to our primary care clinical setting. What if you're at a clinic that has a topographer? What can you do to maximize your yield in detecting patients? Bjorn, can you talk us through what you do in your daily clinic? Yeah, you know, this is a, a, actually a cutout from one of my chart notes um, at a satellite where we don't have a pentacam. So, you know, in, in a perfect world, everybody has a pentacam and you can get the ABC display on everybody. But here, we just had a topographer. So what I do is I, I, I look at topographies and you can look at greater than one diopter increase in SIMK. Some topographers do KMAX. So again, you can do a greater than one diopter increase in KMAX or a greater than one diopter increase in mean K. So the nice thing is um, nowadays, insurance carriers are, are more receptive to different parameters of progression. And as long as you document it and you put, in, put that in your note and you submit it to the insurance company, um, cross-linking almost always gets approved. And then, look, you know, we can sympathize. Not every office has everything. So if you just have a four-opter, you can still make the diagnosis of progressive keratoconus, um, albeit probably a little bit later than ideal, but it can still be done, and, and it, it's better than never, right? So right. Um, things to look for, a myopic shift greater than half a diopter, an increase in astigmatism greater than a diopter, um, a, a one-line decrease in best corrected or uncorrected vision, or someone that requires repeated contact lens fits. Um, and, and, and sometimes, you know, before I can even get serial pentacams to document progression, if I have a young patient that is being referred to me by an optometrist and, and they are telling me these things, that's good enough for me. So I don't need to get pentacam. If I'm seeing something like this from my referring doctor, um, we're gonna go ahead and treat this patient. And, you know, keratoconus, in my opinion, is the perfect disease for collaboration between um, ophthalmologists and optometrists. And, and really, we, we both have to work together to, to early diagnose and break the cycle. So, you know, challenge number one is to make the diagnosis before vision is compromised. And that, that really, that's the optometrist. Um, that is the patient's primary eye care provider. Once that diagnosis is made, uh, we detect progression, we detect it early, and, and we treat, um, and that's the ophthalmologist, right? We will be the ones that, that do the cross-linking and halt the progression of the disease. And then we need the optometrist's help again to get these patients seeing as best as they can. And with our amazing contact lens fitters and the amazing lens technology that are out there, patients with scleral lenses can see really, really well. And you know the need for corneal transplantation in this disease um, is getting less and less and less. And as a corneal transplant surgeon, I love seeing that. You know, I don't want to do transplants for keratoconus. So this is this is our mantra, right? So detect early and stabilize. Um, and and you know, the more technology you have, the better. But even if you don't have an ABCD, look for those changes in K values. Look for those changes in in refraction. Um, look for those changes in, in subjective quality of vision. Um, and and really, if there are other risk factors, like Clark talked about at the beginning of the talk, that should really kind of sound the alarm in your head that this person may have keratoconus. And, and the reason this is important is we have a treatment, right? So we have an FDA approved cross-linking procedure in the United States that works really well. Um, and, and stepwise, you know, this is a patient of mine and, and we'll show you how, kind of the, the steps of the surgery really briefly here, but you know, I'll go ahead and, and, and prep the eye using betadine, um, put a speculum in the eye. Um, and, and I often do this next step right at the slit lamp. Go ahead and use a blunt instrument. This is called a, a, a took blade to go ahead and to breathe the corneal epithelium. I do have to say, full disclosure, this patient has given us permission to, to use this video um, here and elsewhere. 
Uh, so we'll go ahead and debride the corneal epithelium, use a cellulose sponge to kind of get the, uh, the margins nice and clean. That helps promote re-epithelialization down the road. Now we're going to induce um, with riboflavin. So this is viscous riboflavin. It's placed in the eye every two minutes for a total of 30 minutes. Uh, we'll check corneal thickness to make sure it's over 400 microns. That's the threshold that we need, we, uh, we need to meet. We'll check and make sure that there's flare in the anterior chamber, confirming corneal penetration of the riboflavin. Then I'll bring the cross-linking light onto the field and kind of get the patient lined up in the crosshairs, put the speculum um, back in the eye, and then go ahead and turn on the UV light here in just a second. If you haven't seen cross-linking before, it's a, it's a pretty dramatic picture that, that kind of neon, yellow, neon, green light um, is quite striking. And then during the procedure, uh, we apply the UV, UV light for 30 minutes, um, during which we're applying one drop of, of viscous riboflavin um, every two minutes. And, and then, you know, at the end of the case, we put a contact lens on, and, and I typically start an antibiotic and a steroid. Yes, and the reason that I think, Bjorn, you hit the message right on the nail right on the head, which is the important part is the collaboration where we can maintain patients' best vision and, um, you know, and, and now we actually have a tool to scientifically, that's scientifically proven to stop progression. Whereas we did question whether or not contact lens can do that because patients in contact lenses tend not to require, well-fitted contact lenses tend not to require uh, or can greatly defer the need for corneal transplant. But that's only reducing the risk factor of them need re patients requiring corneal transplant, which is not the same thing as stopping progression. When we can truly combine what Biren said, that's st that slow and halt the progression, and then get patients see the best possible, um, that really is the, you know, the, the sort of true goal that I think our patient also want to achieve with us. And here we have a patient who you know, is in the, into the 40s, thinking maybe the patient is not uh, going to progress, went to a contact lens first, and five months later, you could see the difference uh, in terms of that tear prism being eroded by the progression of the cornea. So truly, we need to you, you combine treatment modalities in terms of being able to you know, reliably stop the progression of these keratoconus patients so that we could help them preserve potential visual um, functions to give them the best quality of life and quality of vision. And Biren, also very importantly, after corneal cross-linking, you still need to continue to monitor your patients, whether that's being done with you um, and or being done at the you know, optometric practices. Um, can you talk us through a little bit about this new software function of being able to track patients' treatment? And how yeah, they do it's after a, it's in addition to the the ABCD display, and you know, fortunately, crosslinking is is quite successful at stopping progression. But we still want to monitor, so you can now input when the patient had crosslinking. Uh, so you can just add a new crosslinking treatment, um, select the date that the uh, that the treatment was done, and then. Um, what you'll notice is you'll see a new line. It's a, it's a black dotted line, and that's when the cross-linking was done. And then you'll see these new gates that showed up, right? So we had green, red, and now we got these blue gates. And the blue gates are post-cross-linking gates. And those show up after you've had a scan one year after treatment, because that's when we're really going to start to look for stability. There's changes that happen in the cornea for the first year, and typically we've stabilized out one year out. and then if the patient continues to progress, you'll see those follow-up scans now extend beyond the blue gates. Um, so it's just another tool to, to quickly look at a bunch of data um, all on one sheet and, and make that decision whether the patient is progressing or not. Right. And here's a, just one of the example of patients from our clinic, um, which just showing that um, there the blue gates does appear that the new baseline happens a year afterwards. Uh, and it will continue since patient was stable, we continue to watch these uh, patients. As you can see that nothing crosses the yeah. these blue gates at uh, whether 80% or 95%. Interesting so here, if you, look at the, if you look at the A score, the average anterior cornea, it actually got flatter, right? And that's something that we do see actually with cross-linking yes. that after the procedure over time, not only do we get progression, but sometimes we get improvement in corneal steep. Absolutely. Yeah, and so that we find obviously these, uh, you know, advanced algorithms and, and imaging technologies to be really helpful 
um, for our keratoconus patients in our service. Um, I don't know if, uh, Carver, there are any questions that you would like us to answer uh, in the last few minutes of this presentation. Yeah, there are a few questions I have ready for you. Before we get to those questions, I do have a little bit of housekeeping. Oh, I just want to thank you both so much for the great presentation tonight. Um, and just a reminder for everyone that is watching, if you do have a last minute question, you have the option to enter in those questions into that text box. Uh, and if you missed any part of the webinar this evening, it is being recorded and you will have a recording sent to you in a few days. Alrighty, on to the questions. So I'm gonna kind of go in the order of your presentation. Um, so you started off with kind of what populations are more likely to have keratoconus and you'd mentioned patients with Down syndrome. Is the prevalence of keratoconus um, in patients with Down syndrome high enough to justify regular screening? Uh, beyond just like uh, looking at a slit lamp or just looking at a placido topographer, but like referring out. Um, Bjorn, did you want to take this one or should I go? Um, I, I would say that that's, it's a tough, it's a tough question because there there's such variability in the ability for a patient with Down syndrome to get a good scan on. So in an ideal world, yeah, everybody gets pentacam that has Down syndrome, but the reality of the situation is, you know, we, and we try and try and try in our office, but sometimes you just you just don't get a great scan. Um, that being said, if you have a patient with Downs that that tends to habitually rub their eyes, um, you, know, you talk to the caregivers and they're doing that, um, you know, that that is a big warning sign. I, I'd almost bet that they have keratoconus. Yep, I, I agree. And if you look at the literature, for sure that there are enough. Um, prevalent studies out there that shows that um, patients with certain diseases such as Down syndrome have, um, um, you know, five folds or more risk likelihood of, of uh, developing keratoconus. So I agree with Bjorn that if they have Down syndrome and also are rubbing their eyes, I think that we need to be very careful. Obviously, the limitation is, um, you know, can they reliably give you um, you know, any type of, if you have to rely on vision, because that's a little easier for them to kind of sit through sometimes uh, imaging capture. Um, so the, I think the limitation is on us, it's not on patients. Perfect. Once or twice a year, uh, kind of following up on the Down syndrome, um, I get asked by people that are looking for advice on taking uh, better scans on patients with Down syndrome, and I haven't had the opportunity to interact with those patients. Uh, Biran, do you happen to have any advice for how to make those scans more successful or um, any accommodations you can make? Yeah. I mean, so when when we typically want to have a keratoconus patient come in, I send them through a whole lineup of scans, right? I'm doing topography, OCT, pentacam, autorefraction, this, that, and the other. But if I have someone that I'm a little bit worried, I think my biggest piece of advice is just get one scan, yeah. okay? Try to, or, or at least get the one that you think is most important first, because not only Down syndrome, but even kids, um, that, that attention span drops off really quick. Um, so I would say just try to pick the one that you really, really want. Um, and, and for me, that, that'd be the Pentacam. Great. Perfect. Thank you so much for that great answer for both, you know, uh, anyone that might have challenging, challenges taking a scan. Uh, so I had a few questions regarding topographers. I think some people really took interest in that section. Um, do you feel that looking at tangential curvature maps are any more beneficial than looking at axial sagittal curvature maps? Um, I think we've got, I think we've sort of grappled with that question for a long time now, right? Because I, I do believe that if you look at tangential because of the, the lack of, or at least much less of that averaging or peripheral smooth, smoothing, that smoothing, that um, you have more accurate trend, you can see the geometry of the cornea more accurately. And that may be beneficial for if you really want to, for example, like in fitting your content lenses, if you're relying on corneal geometry to decide, uh, what lens option you're using, and potentially, and this is actually this actually came up with um, during my uh, conversation with uh, Dr. Cynthia Roberts um, last week, which is it's it would more accurately also locate where the cone apex uh, 
is compared to if you're relying on just an Excel map. And so possibly that also guides your treatment. So the question is, what are you using it for? Um, so for those two purposes that I just mentioned, I think it is more beneficial to look at tangential map first. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Chang. All right. I have two more questions that I'm going to kind of wrap into one regarding uh, topography, which are, are you able to detect keratoconus with topography before it affects vision? And is there a way to quantify uh, how much earlier you're able to detect keratoconus with tomography versus topography? I, uh, part one of that question, can you detect keratoconus solely on topography before there are changes in vision? Yes, you can. Um, I've, I've, had signs show up on topography with inferior steepening in a patient with 20-20 vision, right? And this often comes up with, during refractive surgery evaluation. So they'll come into me wanting LASIK, I'll get a topography and a topography and, and, and everything. But even on the topography, you sometimes we'll see some subtle inferior steepening. Now, how can we quantify or can we quantify, you know, how much sooner can you pick it up on tomography versus topography? Honestly, I don't have a number. Um, Clark, I don't, I don't know if you've seen or, or heard or, or your experience has has done that. It's just I have a hard time yeah. giving you a number, you know, six months before or one year before. That's tough. There's actually a publication. I now I'm trying to as you're as Viren is talking, I'm trying to like rack my brain and thinking who's the primary author. I want to actually say it's a it's a Shemi again, um, where they compare it detect detection of keratoconus using different instrument. And I believe they said the the um, um, having the um, either BAD or ABCD, they were able to detect either keratoconus or detect progression like six months. I, and now that I'm talking out loud, I think it's looking at ABCD in a keratoconus patient already diagnosed, uh, being able to detect progression solely rely on ABCD score versus more conventional scores. So even though that doesn't directly answer your question in terms of uh, and, and they found that they were able to diagnose progression at least six months ahead of time. But if they can do that with progression, then you can obviously can imagine that you can detect patients earlier as well. There are other human factors. When do they seek care? You know, when do they come under your care before, you know, after the onset of symptoms, if they notice symptoms? So, and you know, there are there any type of, you know, restriction to, to access of care? There are other things that's going to change that calcula, uh, calculus. Um, but it, it'd be a hard I would study. say at least six months. Yeah, it'd be a hard study to do because you'd have to find someone that only has tomographic changes on the pentacam or, right. or, or any tomographer and then follow them, not intervene and wait for them to develop topographic changes on, on a placebo-based topographer um, and then kind of quantify that. And like, honestly, mm -hmm. nowadays, no, nobody's going to sit there and watch a patient get worse without cross-linking them. So. Yeah, no one should. Yeah. All righty. I have one final question for you. Uh, really digging into those uh, detection metrics. Um, given that the kind of or given that the cornea thins and bulges outwards during kind of the progression of keratoconus, is the anterior chamber depth a useful measure metric for detecting progression? Um, the and mm -hmm. so we do know in severe cones or, or or even moderate cones, we have an increased anterior chamber depth, and and I, you know we get that because of cataract surgery, right? When we're doing cataract surgery on these patients, that's a thing that makes IOL calculations in this patient population more difficult. Um, but in early keratoconus, right. um, it's not as noticeable um, and, and it may even appear to have a fairly normal anterior chamber depth. So I, I personally wouldn't rely on that for, for detection or, or progression. Yeah, I agree. The sensitivity or even specificity, a specificity probably would, is lower than you would desire. It'd be a neat study to do that, looking at the two. I don't know if that's ever been done. It's an interesting idea. Um, but yes. thank you so much for your kind of expertise in answering all of these questions for tonight. Uh, tonight and all of your just wonderful presentation. Uh, unfortunately, that is all the time we have. So thank you everyone who sent in questions and thank you everyone for joining us. Bye everybody, thanks for joining. Thank you, have a good night. Good night.